Like Vinod, I haven't only been on the dark side. I actually was on both sides. I was CEO for 10 years before I became a VC, so some of my advice today is also going to be driven from that. So I want to talk about managing your startup board. And of course, by the way, I'm going to cover a lot of material, but I'm going to publish all these slides on SlideShare so they'll all be available. Many people think about the role of a board as being oversight. You have shareholders, you have a board, you have founders. And of course, legally, this is true. And they have a fiduciary obligation of oversight. But I think one way to think about how to better manage boards is to actually think about managing the board. And when you think about what board members are, they're these super connected people that actually will do work for you. They actually want to do work for you. They actually want to feel relevant and helpful. And if you assign tasks, these are probably the most connected free interns you'll ever have. And I think you might think about it that way. So I love this quote that I saw, which is, I can always get money, but where else can I get very connected and powerful people to do work for me? You'd be surprised how few people actually ask. And in a strange way, what I find many entrepreneurs, when they first raise money, they almost feel like there's a slight adversarial relationship with the board, as though they're worried about somehow getting in trouble, like it's a teacher or something. I have this analogy in my head, which is a bit like parents. Actually, when you do an investment, you sort of have unconditional love for the company you invested in. You actually wrap your own self-identity with whether the company's succeeding or not succeeding. Nobody joins a board and wants to go tell all their friends how shitty it is. <laughs> and so actually, they're rooting for your success, but they have an important role in oversight, just like parents. And I think it's a useful framing for it. And as you grow, sometimes what you think should happen and what your board members think should happen can diverge which is pretty natural. So what I like to tell most founders is, I think you should feel empowered to break things and to do things you're not supposed to do and push boundaries and not always ask for permission. But when you do that, you have a responsibility on the other side to make sure you're keeping your board managed to keep them with you. So what I want to talk about is how to do that. So I have this concept I call the continuous board. And it's maybe a different way of thinking about your board. So you have board meetings. And somehow we think board meetings are the most important part of your interaction with your board. I would argue they're actually the least important part. And most people treat them like it's the most important part. A great board should be people highly engaged and super knowledgeable about what your company does. And if you have a two-way trusted relationship, it should be the people you can call with the most sensitive confidential information that you can't share with anybody else if you build trust. You can't tell anyone else that you're worried about your co-founder or hiring or firing senior people in your company or running out of cash or a customer who's about to abandon you, or a lawsuit that just got filed, or sexual harassment if it exists in your company. There's no one else to share this with, so building a trusting relationship is really important. And yet most entrepreneurs that I come across run what I would call the waterfall board. So if you think of waterfall as software development of how I started my career 25 plus years ago, you go through all these phases only to find out at the end that you're misaligned once you launch your software. And the same is true, I think, of boards, which is you do all these activities for three months and your board's out of the loop, and then you come together for two to three hours to update them at the end, and it should be no surprise to you if you do that that you get misaligned. And yet that's how a lot of people run their boards. So I think continuous involvement is much better for you. It's also much better for your financial and your independent board members. And so regular, frequent interaction and ability to course correct, I think, is incredibly important. 
how to build a high functioning board. So the first thing is, to the extent that everybody knows each other personally and has working relationships, they can resolve differences of opinion. What you find on many boards is you'll have some investors who actually disagree with the strategy or direction of the company. They might disagree about fundraising. They might disagree about how much risk to take, how much costs, how fast to grow revenue, or whether growth matters more than revenue, whether revenue matters more than profit. And they can be misaligned. And then you get to hard decisions, and it's hard to get a group of people all to agree on something. And I can imagine how you must want to bang your head against a brick wall when your board members don't agree. But to the extent they like each other, to the extent they're friendly and know each other, they will resolve conflict. Uh, these are people who really should know your business, know your execution and your financial metrics. I can't tell you how many board meetings I go to where I sit on a board with other board members asking the most basic financial questions that we covered the last three board meetings. And as much as it drives me crazy, and I think, why the fuck didn't they read their materials? Oh, sorry, am I allowed to swear? Yes. Okay, why the hell didn't you, sorry, I should ask. Why the hell didn't you read your materials? I sort of hold the CEO accountable because there's so much that you can do to keep people updated with financial metrics before a board meeting. And this should be important to them relative to their other commitments. If you have board members that are disengaged because they're on two really massive boards that are trending up and they're not paying attention to this, that doesn't help anybody else on your board. They shouldn't have incentives that are misaligned and you can get misaligned incentives. It could be someone who works at a fund that's looking for a quick exit or somebody else that really wants to go long. So I try to think a little bit about incentives. And they and you should always know that your first fiduciary obligation is to the company. Sometimes investors can think and vote and act with their funds fiduciary obligations first. Sometimes CEOs do that rather than thinking about the company and what's right. So these are ways to think about individual board members. And I think to the extent you're thinking about how to get all these people working together, uh, it will really make a difference. So it's in your interest to make sure that we're all working together and people who know each other well can resolve conflicts. So the strategies that I use, number one is board meals, lunches, dinners. They don't have to be every board meeting, but if all you're doing is admin together, you're not really going to build a relationship. You know with your executive team, you plan offsites, you plan social stuff, you try to build personal relationship, you put the energy into that with your management team, and yet not everybody does that with their board. Again, to the extent we all work well together, we're more likely to resolve conflict together. I was on a board about six months ago, and the founder really didn't want to leave the room with the investors together talking amongst each other. I think he was somehow afraid of what we would be saying. And I kept saying to him, it's healthy. It's healthy. Leave the room. Let us talk. Let us, even if we don't agree with you, the more that we're talking amongst each other and resolving conflict, the more we can work to your benefit. And again, with this metaphor that Almost like parents, we, we, we want positive outcomes. So we're not there conspiring for negative outcomes. Uh, but you really have to leave time for those relationships. Uh, board members, I'm going to cover this bit quickly. In the early days, it's founder controlled. As you start to raise rounds, seed, A, B, maybe C, Different investors are going to have fiduciary responsibilities and obligations and are going to want board seats. And somewhere around the B round, it usually shifts to an independent board. I think independent boards are healthy. I think founder complete controlled boards can lead to bad outcomes. I think corporate governance is good. And I don't think this is something you should massively fight against. I'm not saying you don't want to control who goes on the board, but I don't think people should fear it as much as we do today. What makes a good independent board member? I think the starting point for most independent boards, people think, I really want a fancy name. 
I want to have somebody that everybody knows because that's going to add some benefit to me, but it really doesn't add that much benefit to you. So I like to think about somebody local and someone who can be a mentor and someone who will actually spend time on this and prioritize this because that's where you're going to get the most benefit. Somebody who's an honest broker, they really should be independent, but can be a go-between if you have conflict with your investors. Um, so, the, you know, these are the things that I think are important. Someone who actually has startup experience because sitting and working on a board of a startup company is very different than sitting on either a public board or being uh, in a large organization where you run business units. So having that startup experience matters. And one thing that's sometimes controversial, but I like independents who have skin in the game. So what I like to do is ask them to write a $25,000 check or a $50,000 check or a hundred thousand, whatever amount of money is just enough that they feel like they have a reason to care. And for whatever reason, people who $50,000 isn't a lot of money to, once you write a check, you think differently about your responsibilities. And that's why I like to have skin in the game. Board meetings. Uh, this is the area that I think I'm gonna spend a bit more time on. If you ask for people's opinion about your colors and logo, we will debate it for at least 30 minutes. If you ask what should be on the lunch menu, we will debate it for 30 minutes. Anything that we debate, if it frustrates you how much we want to comment on things that you don't think should matter, that's on you. Because we're only going to debate what you put in front of us. And if people want to debate things that aren't put in front of them, you, your job is to politely resist. Take a note, agree to contact them after the meeting, get other board members involved if there's a disruptive board member that always wants to go in the weeds and ask for their help before the board meeting to keep it uh, on schedule. But the role of executive management is to make these decisions, not us. So when it comes to monthly budget, um, when it comes to hiring and firing most of your employees, sales, pricing, product, positioning, channel, stock option allocations, you can ask us. We have opinions on all these things. We'll debate them as much as you want. But I don't think that's the real value you get out of a board. And I think you can do, if you think about the continuous board, you can do a lot of this one-on-one -on -one with individual board members who either care more or maybe have subject matter expertise. What I think a board really should be doing are the big picture things. Strategy, performance, annual budget, fundraising, M&A, and hiring and firing the most senior people in the company. And what I recommend actually is send your materials out. I actually say 72 hours in advance. A lot of people say 48. If I get it the day before, I'll read it, but I'm not really gonna have time to process and think how to be helpful to you. What I actually think is if you send your financial materials 72 hours in advance, schedule a call with your CFO to talk with that board member and walk them through the financials. And once they have all their questions answered and on the table, you don't have to spend this incredibly valuable time together talking about why you grew 18% instead of 24% and keep a board focused on the bigger picture items. And then I just like to point out to people that there are certain things that require investor support, so investor governance above the board. VCs pay a lot of attention to what the voting rights are to get a deal approved on tag-along rights, on drag-along rights, on voting rights, on consent rights, on, and founders don't think that much about it. But it's important for you to understand how governance works, because when you want approval on stuff, you first need board approval, then it will go to investor approval, and the more you understand the thresholds and numbers, the more you'll understand individual people's motivations. So at a board meeting, if you have a spectrum of debate, versus present, let's say on the left-right axis, and inform versus decide on the top-down axis. This is where most people spend board meeting time. Inform and present. I call these filibuster board meetings because you put 100 slides in there, you want every member on your team to talk, and so you run through 100 slides and then at the very end you look for consents. 
well, we need to get these four things approved. These are not that effective of board meetings. All you're doing is informing people and overwhelming them with information. If you're doing that, you must not care about getting any strategic input. What I think is a much better approach is inform and debate. Now, notice that I didn't say inform and decide. Overwhelmingly, if you have really hard debates about what you should do in your company, and you get input from people that you value, and you use it as a way to make sure those people really understand your business, that doesn't mean you, you didn't vote on doing that. You can still, like Ferris Bueller, decide to do what you want to do anyways. But you're getting people's opinions. And you're getting them involved in making decisions with you ultimately, which I think is important. There are sometimes you need approval and you don't really want a lot of input, and you'll go present, and you just say, I want you to sign off on this so you have the legal rights. And then, of course, there's the huge strategic things like fundraising, M&A, hiring and firing senior execs that you really need to debate. So I just think having a framework to think about what you want to achieve at any individual board meeting helps. And think to yourself, do I really want to filibuster? Is that my goal? It's almost like a board meeting for many people is something to get through to say, oh, thank God I don't have to do that for three more months. And that's, again, you'll get the least value out of it if you do that. So I like a quarter, quarterly board meeting structure. I don't think meeting more than four times a year with your group makes that much sense. Um, and then you can break out the year and say, what do I want to achieve with the four shots that I have to have that most important group of people together? I usually say take one of the four and have your senior execs go and present. Why? Because the senior execs, that's a way for them to get exposure to venture capitalists and independent board members and to feel important, and I think that's valuable. And on the flip side, your investors and your independent board members want to start to get to know your senior execs so they can be more helpful. So it's good to do that. But if you do that for four board meetings, you're really never going to discuss anything that strategic with your board because there's just so much you can't share when your entire team is there. Of course, one of the four board meetings has to be an annual budgeting process. That really should be your Q4 board meeting so that you plan out your next year and all your budgets uh, and make those decisions before you actually start the year. Uh, many boards are in February still trying to figure out their annual budget. It's not the world's best thing to do. And then I like to have one board meeting which is pure strategy. No finance, no update, no senior execs. These are the three things really on our mind that we're trying to change the dimensions of the company. And if you want to do that well, you have to prepare. So for me, if you do like a 10-page keynote set up with charts and graphs and positioning and where do we want the business to go, and these are the three or four issues we're really trying to decide on, send it out as uh, one of the CEOs that I work with calls pre-read materials. These are my pre-reads. Read this. Be prepared. And then we actually come together as a group to debate it. But we come in informed rather than come in to be presented to. He could take those same slides and just spend an hour and a half walking us through them. But to the extent I've read it, then I'm coming to the board meeting prepared to discuss it. So boards. At the best moments, they're cheerleaders, they're coaches, mentors, occasionally disappointed mom and dad. But I think this is important to think in this framework, which is they are people who want you to succeed. They're out telling people about your company and how great they think it is. Their personal identity is tied up in your successes, and their personal identity suffers from your failures. They are not naturally adversaries to you. They're not rooting for your failure. But even your biggest champions have oversight responsibilities. And ultimately, they have to step in if they don't think what you're doing is right. And that creates tension when they disagree with what you're doing. But to the extent that you're managing these relationships throughout the year and not waiting for board meetings where this adversarial relationship builds up, 
all these micro corrections that happen through, throughout the year leads to a much healthier relationship. So that's, that's all I got. Thank you. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Sonny. Any specific advice for um, roles, responsibilities, or for chairman of the boards and executive chairman? So the question, if anyone didn't catch it, was chairman and roles and responsibilities for a chairman. So I actually was on boards in uh, the UK for a long time where chairman is normally separated from chief executive and in the US it often isn't. Um, I think it's incredibly helpful to have a chairman who's independent of the CEO. Um, if you're going to have a chairman, and many startup boards don't, but if you're going to have a chairman, I think of it almost as a super independent. And I think that the role should be in helping you as CEO organize the disparate opinions that exist around the table, helping prepare for difficult decisions. Um, I had a chairman of my company when I was CEO. I had some really early stage investors who really didn't want us to raise a lot of money and take on risk because their funds weren't able to com continue investing. And I had some very large funds that wanted me to go raise $20, $30 million. And they really were out of sync, and we spent a lot of time fighting over strategic direction. What my chairman was able to do is be a proxy for me. That's when I talk about independent board members of being like an honest broker and having diplomacy, to have the hard conversations that I didn't have to have because I didn't want to put my prestige on the line in resolving conflict. So for me, the role of chairman, the most important role, is resolving conflict around the most difficult things you have to do in the company. Anything else? Um. domain expertise from, sorry, like uh, how it's important to have uh, people with different domain expertise in your board. If your business is complex enough and it's just hard to get one person who will just have all this expertise, especially for early days, right? So yeah. do you want to try to achieve that or it's not what you're looking to do? You don't want to use board as experts, basically. Right? Well, so the question being about different opinions, I think it's incredibly important uh, I believe in diversity. I believe in diversity on your board. I think diversity, the most important thing is diversity of thought. Uh, if you have five white men who all have the exact same background, you're going to have at least a similar narrative and journey in life. Uh, so introducing diversity uh, of gender, of ethnicity, of education, of region, of geography, but also of domain experience is only going to increase the ideas that come around the table. I think it's incredibly important. Great. I think we have one time for one more if we have one. Okay. Well, let's thank Mark. Thank you. Great talk. Appreciate it.